you can murder a liberator, but you can't murder liberation. Judas and the Black Messiah uses a spin on the biblical story of Judas to challenge and reclaim the mainstream historical narrative of the Black Panther Party. The film shows Chairman Fred Hampton as a Jesus-like healer, bringing a radically loving, unifying message to the people in the 1960s. You know how many people we could save in five years? Meanwhile, his Judas-like betrayer, Bill O'Neill, is portrayed as a tool of the FBI, the greater white establishment, and capitalism itself. Nice work, Bill. Ultimately, the film translates Jesus and Judas' story into a clash between socialism and capitalism. I will make sure you're properly compensated. And the story encourages us to rethink all that we've been taught about the villains and victims of history, as well as about the present systems we accept and live under. A non-capitalist state, that's what we're talking about. Most of all, it warns us to avoid a mindset of self-preservation and apathy, because seeing yourself as not part of the fight for change amounts to helping keep things the way they are. And I think what you, what you see in this film is the danger of not caring, the danger of apathy how like, and the danger of self-preservation. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. I want to thank NordPass for sponsoring today's video. If you're anything like me, there's nothing more annoying than forgetting your password and having to reset it. NordPass remembers all of your passwords for you and even autofills online forms. So if you want to stop worrying about being locked out of your accounts, click the link in the description below, nordpass.com slash thisisthetake, and use the code thisisthetake to get 50% off a one-year NordPass premium plan. It's a limited time deal, so hurry. You think you're preserving yourself, taking care of yourself, taking care of yourself, taking care of yourself, and it led to him destroying himself. The movie reframes the biblical divide between Christian Messiah Jesus and his betrayer Judas as essentially a dispute between socialism and capitalism. In simplified terms, Jesus and Fred Hampton are both socialists in that they believe in taking care of all people's needs. Our breakfast program fees over 3,000 kids a week. While Judas and Bill, and the FBI controlling Bill, are capitalists in that they put their individual needs first. Right after we first glimpse Fred Hampton, we hear him say, We're going to fight capitalists and socialists. Fred's socialism believes people have a right to three key pillars, which his Panther Party provides to his community, food, health care, and education. First, you have free breakfast. Then you have free health care. Then you have free education. Next thing you know, you look up, you done freed your motherfucking say. Meanwhile, he views capitalism as a means of exploiting the people, regardless of the race of rich members of society. No matter what color he is, black, white, brown, red, don't matter. Because the capitalist has one goal, and that is to exploit the people. Modern capitalism as we know it didn't exist in Jesus' time, but it's safe to say he would have hated it. Blessed are you, Paul, for yours is the kingdom of God. In the book of Matthew, Jesus declares that the meek, i.e. poor, will inherit the earth. Matthew also describes a scene where Jesus cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers, saying they'd made his house of prayer into a den of thieves. Just as our first glimpse of Fred features his embrace of socialism, our first introduction to Bill shows him deeply under the sway of capitalism, attempting to steal a car to chase material wealth. When this leads to his arrest, he's presented with a choice that sets off the events of the movie. He can avoid punishment and choose his personal freedom if he helps the FBI infiltrate Panthers. You're looking at 18 months for the stolen car and five years for impersonating a federal officer or you can go home. Bill believes that he can get ahead in the system if he can just make enough money. His conversations with FBI agent Roy Mitchell all come back to this question. Say I get you like some good information, uh, something nobody else know. Is it some kind of bonus or something? Well, y'all gonna have to come up off some serious f***ing dough for this, all right? Capitalism convinces the individual it's a necessary evil to let others suffer so that you can enrich yourself or avoid negative consequences. My recruitment by the FBI was very efficient. They had a potential case against me, and I was looking for an opportunity to uh, work it off. 
The American dream tells us that through hard work through the ranks, any person can achieve success. But that wasn't true in the 60s, and it's arguably even less true for a lot of Americans today. When a rare person who's not a privileged white male does achieve remarkable success, the narrative put out there is that others can follow their example just by working hard within the system. America, a place where even orphan immigrants can leave their fingerprints and rise up. But Judas and the Black Messiah calls out individualism as ultimately selfish. Uh, I'm all for civil rights, but you can't cheat your way to equality. One person getting rich won't help the collective, and here it even comes explicitly at the expense of shared progress. Moreover, capitalism doesn't necessarily even work for the individual, however willing they may be to sell out. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Bill views FBI agent Roy Mitchell as his role model. We had very few role models back then. We had uh, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, I had an FBI agent. And he's driven by a fantasy of obtaining his mentor's life. Hey, how much money you make, man? It's, uh, it's living. But like the biblical figure, he ends up with a measly 30 pieces of silver. They're for a gas station. And Maywood, it's yours. The capitalist version of freedom Bill has been chasing, financial security, turns out to be a paltry shadow of what real freedom should be. You own your own business now, Bill. You're free. After Hampton's assassination, the real-life Bill O'Neill was given a $300 bonus, though the movie reports he made an equivalent of over $200,000 total over his years of informing. Also like Judas, Bill O'Neill eventually killed himself. In his case, the night of the PBS premiere of docuseries Eyes on the Prize 2, featuring his interview exposing the extent of what he'd done. I just began to realize that the information that I supplied leading up to that moment had facilitated that raid. This story underlines that capitalism's catering only to the needs of the self fails to provide a greater sense of purpose, while Fred's or Jesus's socialism offers a purpose and fulfillment so powerful that the individual can cease to be afraid for their own person. Before Fred is about to go to prison, he just wants to talk about the party and the people. Y'all spending all this time talking about me going to Algerian bungalows, and you need to be talking about how we gonna build this motherfucking medical clinic. Is the party about me or is it about the people? He's not even afraid of dying. They put the same shit on Martin and Malcolm. Mm-hmm. And what happened to them? Same shit that won't happen to all of us. At least they died for the people. We should be so lucky. His lack of self-concern is itself a form of freedom. It makes it impossible for the FBI to control Fred or use him against the Black Panther Party's mission. I believe I'm gonna die half the people. I'm gonna die for the people because I live for the people. As he himself predicts, Hampton does die as a casualty of his cause of the future liberation for his people, in obvious parallel to Jesus, who was crucified and died for the sins of humankind past and future. On the other hand, this total disregard for the individual isn't always pragmatic. Hampton himself has great personal importance and value to his party. People haven't thought about what it means to lose a Fred Hampton who somehow was able to pull together blacks and whites and Puerto Ricans and Native Americans to fight for justice at 21. The loss of Hampton among other leaders of his time who were strategically targeted by law enforcement led to major setbacks for racial equality for decades. And when you strip out a whole generation of leadership, you will be vulnerable to Bill Clinton or anybody else. And they'll do to you what they will. There are also huge sacrifices that come with devoting oneself to the whole. When I dedicated my life to the people, I dedicated my life. Deborah, the mother-to-be of Fred's child, calls out how, when the individual becomes a family, this complicates the revolutionary's commitment to always putting his safety last. You get to go out there, talk about dying a revolutionary death and how your, your body belonged to the revolution because you don't have another person growing inside your body. But while concern for one's family can be one of our most primal forms of love, when taken to an extreme and prioritized over the rest of society's well-being, it's also an extension of individualism. In the film, we see the FBI successfully use the American romance for family to control its members and channel that instinctive protectiveness toward the idea of defending our way of life, which is a sentimental way of talking about the white supremacist status quo. Think of your family now, Agent Mitchell. Think of Samantha, because that's what's at stake if we lose this war. Our entire way of life. 
Roy works the same seduction on Bill through making him feel included in the stereotypically all-American lifestyle. No, no, sit down. You're a guest. Uh, if you want a taste of the good stuff, there's a bottle of scotch in this bottom cabinet there. So ultimately, Judas and the Black Messiah advocates a fundamental shift in how many of us think. Instead of solely considering the perspective of how a situation affects me or my family, to think more often of the greater we. Is there any redemption you can find for somebody like that? He is a pawn. It's the, it's the FBI. While it's tempting to blame the Judas in this story, the movie underlines that Bill is really a pawn for the greater villain, the FBI, which is an extension of the greater white establishment. Every time the pig shoot down an unarmed brother and sister in the street, man daily pull the trick. Tricky Dicky Nixon is the fattest, most filthy pig in the pig. We first see Fred through the eyes of the FBI planning to come after him in a deliberate attempt to destroy any potential black messiah who could affect major social change. Malcolm's whole entourage was infiltrated with police, so afraid of black dissent. This opening reminds us how intentionally the FBI's COINTELPRO program destroyed black community leaders through jailing and stone cold assassination. He's good and dead now. The other way the white establishment destroyed a generation of black messiahs was through a campaign of ideas in media and education that successfully discredited the Black Panther ideology for decades after this event. Free legal aid education for the community. The Black Panthers are the single greatest threat to our national security. A key aim of Judas and the Black Messiah is to reframe and reclaim the narrative of who the Panthers really were. These motherfuckers ain't no terrorists. The white establishment's prevailing narrative in the media has long framed the Black Panther Party as radical, dangerous terrorists, even as the other side, equivalent of the KKK. The Panthers and the Klan are one and the same. Their aim is to sow hatred and inspire terror. But here, it's the FBI and law enforcement who are the scary, violent ones. Badge is scarier than a gun. A badge is like you got the whole damn army behind you. The film also contextualizes the Panthers taking up arms as self-defense against ongoing police brutality. The first thing that the Black Panther Party did was to set up an armed patrol in order to ensure that, that Black people were not harassed and intimidated by uh, the local police department. The socialist ideas of Panthers and Hampton were also painted as scary and radical. To this day, the very word socialism is used for fear-mongering. Venezuela a rich country blessed with bountiful natural resources, is now a hellhole. Look what its experiment with socialism has wrought. But the film highlights what these ideals really mean through scenes of the Panthers' community work. Free medical clinic, free breakfast children program, the intercommunal institute and liberation schools. The film also spotlights the Panthers' belief in equality and respect for women. These aren't just your sisters, they're your sisters in arms. And the writing strips down these ideas to their basics to remind us that, in its simplest form, socialism is just making sure all citizens' basic needs are fulfilled in order for them to live. Be cool, you be cool. No, let's see. But like, just <laughs> socialism, man. Well, you gotta warm up. Man. Many school curriculums have also historically failed to do the Panthers justice through lack of attention devoted to the topic. Traditionally, schools have spent more time on figures of less radical, more incremental change, like Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, while skimming over the history of Huey Newton or the Black Panther Party. They really didn't teach us much about the Black Panthers. Like, you know, they they, they would teach us about Martin Luther King, drips and drabs of Malcolm X. Um, Rosa Parks, a lot of Martin Luther King. And then, Mention the Malcolm X and then skip to JFK. Yet in the film, we hear Hampton explain the Panthers' ideology of revolution. We in the Black Panther Party don't believe in no culture except revolutionary culture. What we mean by that is a culture that will free you. And why he believes reform just isn't effective. That's the difference between revolution and the candy coated facade of gradual reform. Reform is just the masters teaching the slaves how to be better slaves. He also explicitly makes the point that putting people of color in higher positions while still perpetuating capitalism won't work. We ain't gonna fight capitalism and black capitalism. The solution has to go deeper into the very system that thrives on financial and class inequality. This is why through the Rainbow Coalition program, he forms alliances with impoverished white people, gangs, and people of all races because they all have in common that they're being subjugated by the status quo. 
If this building caught fire right now, what would y'all worry about, huh? If somebody would ask you, what's your culture during this fire, brother? Wall. That's my culture. Well, how about your politics? Wall and escape. Hampton's thought is radical in that it rejects our existing capitalist system, but the script underlines that it's also completely logical, natural, and most of all, democratic. Life, liberty, happiness. I mean, it's all right there in the Declaration of Independence. But when poor people demand it, it's a contradiction. It's not democracy, it's socialism. A key reason that Bill is ripe for being exploited by the FBI is that he's apathetic. He doesn't put enough conscious thought into understanding or acknowledging his personal feelings about the wider social struggle. Were you upset when Dr. King was murdered? And what about Malcolm X? I never thought about all that. Bill doesn't want to take down the Panthers. Personally, he likes and admires them. In moments, we glimpse Bill merging with the Panthers, gaining a sense of deep camaraderie and purpose through their collective mission. That day at the speech, watched you, I remember thinking to myself, he really believes this shit. And the real life Bill O'Neill also spoke highly of Fred. The FBI, I tried to come up with uh, signs of him doing drugs or, or something and uh, never could. He was clean. He was dedicated. We got along pretty well. Yet Bill's problem is he doesn't examine or listen to these deeper feelings. I had to conceal those feelings, which made it worse. I just had to continue to play the role. His instinctive capitalist dedication to self-preservation, combined with his failure to connect with his true emotion, leads him to carry out immoral actions that make him sick. I'm not gonna poison him, you hear me? Look, all it's gonna do is just make him sleepy. You want him to go easy, right? Bill's story reveals the lie that it's possible for the individual to stay out of social conflicts like racial injustice. And if you think you're staying out of it, that means you're really upholding the status quo. A status quo where black people are oppressed, poor, discriminated against, and killed by police. I took on the eyes of uh, uh, somebody who didn't give a damn about nothing but themselves. The movie opens by reenacting the Eyes on the Prize 2 interviewer asking Bill, Looking back, on your activities in the late 60s, early 70s. What would you tell your son about what you did then? And at the end of the film, we hear the real Bill's answer. I don't know what I'd tell him other than uh, I was part of the struggle. I think I let, it, let history speak for me. This frame encourages us to look at our own lives through this lens of how proud we will be to tell our children or grandchildren about the role we played in history. 2020 saw one of the biggest civil rights movements in the history of the world. While more and more people are getting fed up with today's hyper-capitalism, viewing it as a rigged game that rewards the wealthy while ruining the lives of the majority through long hours, minimum breaks, and little pay. Jeff Bezos made $11.5 million every hour of the pandemic, and yet he shared almost none of it with warehouse workers. Fred Hampton's message about the power of the people and the community resonates. And the whole neighborhood came out. Pushers, the grannies, the crowns. Anywhere there's people. He's power. While Fred himself may come across in this film as almost a superhuman saint, his shocking murder reminds us just how human and vulnerable he really was. I'm trying to show that this man is a human being. But from this tragic injustice, we can take away that every one of us too has the power to be part of a greater whole. We can contribute to a success that's more beautiful than any of our separate individual goals could ever be. You have the capacity, anyone out there has the capacity to go out there and support their community. Thanks again to NordPass for sponsoring today's video. If you have multiple social media profiles, then you really need a password manager to keep all your accounts safe and make sure you're never locked out. Without one, you may be vulnerable to hackers who can do a lot of damage and potentially even get to your bank account. When it comes to password managers, my favorite is NordPass. It protects your social media accounts and stores your passwords in a private password vault. NordPass was designed by the cybersecurity team at NordVPN, who are experts at protecting personal information information from hackers. If you're done trying to keep track of all your passwords on your own, click the link in the description below, nordpass.com slash this is the take, and use the code this is the take to get 50% off a one-year NordPass premium plan.